Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Juliana Roth, and I am the media specialist here at Rivertown Film Society. Um, and I'm also a local writer and filmmaker, so I'm particularly excited for this discussion tonight. Uh, for those of you who are new, Rivertown Film Society is the sole film nonprofit here in Rockland County, and it's devoted to celebrating, exploring, and promoting the art of motion picture. Uh, we also um, are excited to announce that we'll be having our first in-person screening in years. <laughs> uh, and that will be on Saturday, July 17th with a rain date on the 18th at the Edward Hopper House Museum Study Center in the Garden at 8.30. And we'll be showing a documentary on another uh, Rockland related artist and based artist, Bill T. Jones. Uh, Can you bring it Bill T. Jones and D-Man in the Water? So, that's going to be a really exciting event and we're excited to be able to join together with people in person again. Um, but tonight we are talking about Truman and Tennessee, which i um, assuming a lot of people in the audience already watched or are planning to watch sometime soon. And we're joined tonight by uh, Nick Norwood, who is the director of the Carson McCullough Center for Writers and Musicians. Uh, which is an offshoot of, the, of Columbus State University, and also joined by Karen Clark, who is a board member of River River Writer Circle, which is a local writer circle here in Nyack. And um, we want to also thank our partners, Nyack Library, uh, Pride Rockland, and River River, as well as Carson McCuller Center. So with that, um, if you have any questions for any of the panelists, feel free to write them in the chat or about halfway through, um, there'll be a chance for you to unmute and talk with us. Um, but if anything comes up during the discussion too, please feel to use the chat. We'll be monitoring that and we're always excited to hear what you all are thinking. Um, so I wanna get started by asking Nick, you know, why, why he's here. <laughs> um, Carson McCullers was an incredibly prolific writer before she died at 50 years old. And she also lived here in Nyack, uh, where we are based, er, in Rockland County, where we are based. Um, so she was close friends with Tennessee Williams and he even referred to her as the greatest living writer of his time. So why is it important that we talk about McCullers in relation to this film? Well, um, Carson McCullers had a relationship with both Tennessee Williams and with Truman Capote, and um, they both um, had, uh, well, they both spent a lot of time at the Carson McCullers house, what we now know as the Carson McCullers house, uh, in Nyack um, with, with uh, Carson. Um, Truman, uh, excuse me, Tennessee Williams read The Member of the Wedding uh, when it came out in 1946, and this was right when his career was taking off. And he wrote Carson McCullers a fan letter, apparently the first fan letter he ever wrote. I don't know if it was the only one ever he ever wrote, but they formed a friendship and he invited her to come uh, to a house he had rented on Nantucket for the summer. Um, and they would spend the summer writing and she took him up on it and uh, he encouraged her to turn her novel, The Member of the Wedding, into a play, which she did. And it was a huge success and ran for 501 performances on Broadway. It was the biggest financial success of her career. And she and Tennessee Williams were friends for the rest of her life. They were very close friends. He spent a lot of time at the house in Nyack. Um, and here's a lot of you probably already know that the, at, that the house in Nyack um, is divided into five apartments. And that was at the second uh, suggestion of Tennessee Williams. Um, in fact, I've even heard that he put up some of the money um, to have the renovations done. So um, they uh, also um, did a performance at uh, the 92nd Street Y, um, which uh, recordings of are available. It's quite hilarious. They were both drunk on uh, martinis, which they were drinking on stage. Um, and the thing was, uh, Carson had been asked to come and do a reading there, and she didn't feel that she was up to it because of her health, but she asked Tennessee Williams to come and do the reading. Um, at that point, Carson was convinced that Truman Capote was basically ripping her off and that he had stolen parts of her story, A Tree, A Rock, A Cloud, and put it into some of his own one of his own books. 
And so the story that she told later was that that night at the 92nd Street Y, um, while they're up on their own stage, she looked out and saw Truman Capote in the audience and said, I'm going to get back at him right now. And so she directed Tennessee Williams to read that specific passage of the story. Now, what's funny is Truman Capote later claimed that he was not there, uh, but a number of people said he was there. Um, but uh, I'll just say this one other thing, because I could go on for our entire half hour talking about, uh, about this, the relationships um, among them. But um, Carson's sister, Rita Smith, was fiction editor at Mademoiselle Magazine. And she encouraged the head fiction editor, George Davis, uh, to publish a story by this unknown writer, Truman Capote, and it's the story Miriam, which is mentioned in the film. He says it's the only story he ever wrote that won an award. It was published in Mademoiselle, and then it won uh, an O. Henry Award. Um, and so Rita Smith, uh, who was friends of Truman's at that point, um, you know, encouraged George Davis to run that story. And then Truman became sort of part of that group that uh, of, of all those people running around, Carson and Tennessee and uh, Rita and other people. And in fact, uh, the story goes that Truman was at the house in Nyack when Carson and her husband Reeves were about to move to France. And he was making the arrangements uh, for them to get to the uh, ship. They, they sailed on the Ile de France. Um, he was making arrangements uh, on the telephone and also accompanied them um, to the port when they left for France. It's also at that house in Nyack that apparently Carson's mother, Bibi, because Carson was claiming that Truman was ripping her off, uh, called Truman Capote a toad <laughs> and told him to get out of the house, the house right there at 131 South Broadway in Nyack. And he left and apparently uh, they never saw him again. So I'm gonna stop right there, but obviously there's <laughs> lots of juicy stuff to talk about relating uh, to those, those relationships. Yeah, no, I think that that is really interesting to hear locally, especially thinking about gender and the role like women end up taking on in creative communities. And, you know, obviously who has this documentary too. Um, but I was curious if um, Karen too, I know you're writing, the writing group meets at, or used to meet <laughs> when we could at the house there in Nyack. So I was curious if either of you could share anything about McCullough's legacy in the county that may be of interest. So how did she end up here? Um, what was it like in that house? Who was, we, we know there were a lot of uh, literary icons in that house, but um, what was it like to be there on a daily basis for artists? Well, we were there once a week. We would meet there on Friday afternoons and I can't speak for everybody, but I don't know, the creative juices just flowed in there. I started a novel in there because the prompt was go pick up a book off the wall, open it to any page and see if you get inspired. And I happened on a biography of Shirley Jackson that had just come out, flipped open to an incident in the life of her daughter. And I'm like, okay, off to the races. And then it turned into a story and the story wanted more. And then it turned into a long story. And suddenly I had a novella and now I've got 250 pages. Anybody know a publisher? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, and, and just people really, really just got into it and really couldn't stop getting that pen off the page, the juices were flowing when we were there. I don't know if there's a ghost, but if there is, it's a beneficent one. <laughs> um, and Nick, I know you were talking earlier about why Carson even came to Rockland County. I was curious if you could share a little bit of that with the audience. Yeah, she when she um, graduated from high school in Columbus in 1934, soon after that, she moved to New York to become famous, which she did. Uh, and there's a lot of hilarious, partly fictional stories that have been told about uh, what happened to her when she came to New York. But one thing that we did do know for sure is that she met two um, really famous people who would be her friends for a long time. Janet Flanner, who later wrote for The New Yorker for years and years, um, and Henry Varna Poor, who lives where Karen now lives or lived where Karen now lives in New City. And I have confirmed recently with uh, Carlos Dews, uh, McCullough Scholar, that it was Henry Varnum Poor 
who encouraged uh, Carson and her mother to move to Nyack. Carson's father had died of a heart attack in Columbus in 1944, um, and her mother sold the house here uh, and some other property, and uh, she and Carson wanted to live together. They wanted to live uh, near New York City, but not right in the city. And Henry Varnum Poor said, I know the perfect place. And so uh, that's why they ended up in Nyack. Originally, they lived in that apartment building uh, that is now what I call the cat house, uh, the, the veterinary clinic that is right next to the Carson McCullers house. There was an apartment building there that they lived in first. Um, and then they bought the house at 131. Um, and uh, Carson lived there until her death in 1967. Um, and so she's buried in Oak Hill Cemetery there in Nyack, as is her mother. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's, that's basically the story. Wow, <laughs> it's really interesting. And um, I wonder, like, it comes up bo in both of the answers a lot, like this idea of the lore around artistic friendships and, and gossip. And that came up a lot in the film. Um, the idea of gossip and gossip becoming literature and becoming this like self-fulfilling <laughs> uh, cycle in a way. Um, so what role do you think friendship plays both in the lives of these artists, but in just general, like how does friendship and rivalry seem to play out? Go ahead, Karen. What did you want to? Well, I, I would say that um, artists and writers tend to congregate, they form circles and the circles become movements. I mean, I'm sure many of us can think of a lot of them right off the top of our head, you know, the um, Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, um, um, uh, me out i'm going blank <laughs> i knew all this um, there was the bloomsbury group the bloomsbury uh, for group, yeah. exactly. mm -hmm. and uh yeah so they all tend to group together and they all give each other a helping hand and everything is very jolly until someone gets a little more famous and then the rivalry and the anxiety and the insecurity tends to kick in and i see that there's a question um yes algonquin round table exactly mm -hmm. um so Somebody was asking which story is Truman Capote supposed to have stolen from Carson McCullers? I don't know. Which one did she say? We, we have to look it up. Um, it is the, uh, the harp, the, the grass harp, I think it is called. Oh. Um, and there is a passage in, her, in McCullers' story, A Tree, Rock, a Cloud, which, by the way, connects to uh, the Film Society because we screened Karen Allen's film made, made from that story. Um, where the old man talks about his science of love. And Carson felt that Truman Capote had stolen parts of that for his uh, novel, The Grass Harp. As I said, other people look closely at his book and at her story, and they couldn't see that connection. <laughs> but, but she swore that, you know, as she liked to say, he was been uh, poaching on her preserves. Uh, anybody could see that, she said. So anyway. And who was it who said good art? Good artists borrow, great artists steal. I mean, everybody's influenced, right? Right. Yeah. And everybody reads everybody, so it does all make its way in. Yeah. Well, I think it, it, it's true what you say, Karen, is that, you know, then it begins this, this competition. And when someone has success, then other people get envious. And it's true about Carson that she had those early successes. And then for various reasons, mostly to do with her health, I think, you know, it, it was really hard for her to finish that last novel even, much less to produce work at the rate she had been producing it. And, you know, it seems to me that it sort of broke into factions. Um, and it, it was the Carson and Tennessee faction um, versus um, the Truman and Harper Lee faction. And, you know, there were other divisions in Southern literature as well, but I know that, that Carson admired Faulkner and apparently he, he admired Carson McCullers. Um, and she admired Eudora Welty, although uh, Catherine Ann Porter had told Eudora Welty to stay away from Carson and those other uh, slur for homosexuals that she used. Um, and uh, so th there was a lot of factionalism going on there. Uh, you know, Flannery O'Connor said about Carson's last novel, it's the worst book I ever read. Uh, and, and Carson also felt that Flannery O'Connor was maybe 
stealing from her a little bit. You know, Carson got really uh, paranoid almost, you know, that everybody is trying to uh, capitalize on my success. Um, but she didn't so much have that with, with Tennessee Williams because they, they were really close friends, though uh, she was um, not happy about the fact that he had greater success on Broadway than she did, even though she had had great success. And it seems like partly with his help, um, she, she, she was unhappy about the fact that his success um, was greater. But I think in the case of the writers we're talking about, there were two factions basically that evolved. That's my sense of it anyway. There was the Carson and Truman faction and there was the, excuse me, the Carson and Tennessee faction and the Truman and Harper Lee faction. And again, Carson also felt that Harper Lee was ripping her off, so. <laughs> I love that you bring that up, that division, because uh, as we were, we were talking a little bit before that this documentary is structured in such an unusual way. And I know the director talked about the way time is not a thing, like the linear narrative is not a thing for her. It's more just like a conversation. Um, so why, why a dual documentary, do you think? Obviously we're, you know, we're speculating a little bit, but why do you think that was chosen as the format rather than just having a documentary about one of these writers? <laughs> like, would they yeah. have existed with each, without each other? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, their lives were kind of on a parallel trajectory in many ways, weren't they? I mean, the um, the early fame, the, the self-destructive behavior and the alcoholism later. Um, I was reading the Donald Wyndham memoir, which is called Lost Friendships, a memoir of Truman Capote, Tennessee William and others. And uh, Harper Lee has a blurb on the back that uh, she's talking about lost friendships. And she said, you read it with the sensation that their lives were ticking time bombs, which must inevitably explode in tragedy for the two American artists so vivid on the pages. And I was thinking, wow, ticking time bombs that must inevitably explode. That's could just as easily be a description of in cold blood or most of what uh, happens in Tennessee's plays, you know? That makes for an interesting, dramatic narrative. Two ticking time bombs that are going along together and occasionally boom. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah. it makes perfect sense to put them together in a film. Yeah. Well, and they, they you know, there are the obvious ways that they're connected. They're Southern writers. Mm -hmm. yep. um, they're, uh, they're a sexual orientation, I think. Uh, they're being... Um, um, outside of the mainstream in the places where they grew up in the small town southern uh, environments. And, you know, this is another way that they uh, think they had in common with Carson McCullers. But also, you know, I obviously I've read a lot more about Carson McCullers than about um, Truman Capote and Tennessee Williams. But uh, one of the things that sticks out to me is they ev everybody knew everybody. I mean, they all went to parties. Uh, you know, Gore Vidal uh, pops up. Uh, a number of times in these stories uh, involving uh, the, the, these uh, three people, uh, Tennessee, Truman, and Carson. Um, so, you know, I, I think that uh, th they were together. It's funny, you, you could have, instead of just making it about the film about Truman and Tennessee, it could have been about Truman and Tennessee and Carson and Gore Vidal and maybe even Harper Lee, you know, you could, you can include all of those people and probably some other people as well. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And um, you both touched on it, but it, the film and their lives fall into that trope of male genius and artistic suffering. And uh, Karen, you mentioned In Cold Blood and how it deals with, you know, what, at what cost do we create art? And I'm just curious, like, do you think as a culture, um, in your opinion, are we evolving beyond that sort of image or the obsession with like the self-destructive artist? Um, do you have any ideas of like alternative images for the artist's life? Well, yeah, Raymond Carver got sober and changed the ball game for everybody. He wrote better <laughs> after he sobered up. <laughs> So yeah, we, we live in the age where, uh, you know, um, people get treated for addiction and alcoholism, thank <laughs> goodness. So um, that, you know, you, you, 
it's not a question so much of uh, did they, you know, did they write because they were tortured so much to me as what could they have written if they weren't tortured and self-destructive? What might we have seen if they weren't? We'll never know. Yeah, it's interesting. It, it, it is, I think it, we are evolving away from that. And um, I, I wish I could say that I thought it was all good. Um, the, the thing is, it seems like we found new problems for artists and writers. And the new problems involve, um, I don't know, the media and, and uh, social media and things like that, that um, seem destructive in, in other ways, you know? Uh, but I do think that that idea of the tortured genius that we seem to be getting away from that. And, yeah. and that that's probably a good thing. Yeah. Can you imagine those two if they had Twitter accounts? <gasps> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I think of when you talk about all the gossip and the way they would destroy each other in the books. It does feel like early, <laughs> early subtweeting or something. Um, mm. But I, you're you touched on it too a little bit earlier with uh, McCullough's illness, and I feel like some of that, what could they create if they weren't suffering, ties into like disability and writing as well. Because, like you said, her, you know, her career really um, was influenced by her health. Um, so, what um, what might you be able to share? We didn't really talk about that, but I'm just curious if you have anything to share about what was Carson dealing with. Um, at the time that these men were, you know, being really prolific? Um, well, she had apparently had uh, rheumatic fever as a teenager, and it was misdiagnosed as pneumonia. And, uh, you know, it weakens the heart. And she was a very heavy smoker and a very heavy drinker, like the worst things that you could possibly do. Um, and so she had her first stroke when she was in her 20s. And by the time she was in her 30s, she was paralyzed on part of her body. And, you know, she died at age 50 from the last uh, massive stroke that she had in, um, in, in 1967. So uh, those health problems uh, were, were the main, that, that was the main thing that she was dealing with. It was the result of this rheumatic fever and, and the uh, harm that it had done to her health. But she was also suffering from alcoholism. She also had a bout of breast cancer. Uh, in the middle of all of this. So um, her health was really terrible. And then she had um, a very tragic relationship with the man that she married and divorced twice, Reeves McCullers, who was also an alcoholic uh, and also uh, sexually ambiguous. Uh, and um, when he committed suicide in a hotel room in Paris in 1953, I mean, it was devastating to her. Uh, even though she had divorced him for the second time. So in addition to her physical health, she had emotional issues that, uh, that she was struggling with for the last, you know, 10 to 15 years of her life. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we have a question coming in related to that, that uh, both Truman Capote and Tennessee Williams have reflected on how Carson treated her husband. So are there any thoughts on the sides of this issue and how Truman and Tennessee saw it? Well, uh, Truman Capote became very close friends with Reeves McCullers. So did Janet Flanner, by the way. And uh, there are a number of really famous people uh, in those circles who uh, developed close friendships with, with uh, Reeves McCullers. Uh, uh, he and David Diamond had a relationship at one point. Um, and uh, Truman Capote was at his funeral in France and apparently was weeping unconsolably and 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 yelled out uh, <laughs> my childhood is over uh and um so he was very close to uh to reeves and carson mccullers um received a lot of criticism uh for how she dealt with uh reeves's death and um you know not doing what a lot of people thought that she should have done but uh, Tennessee Williams basically, um, you know, stayed true to her through all of it and, and defended her and supported her um, through, through all of the things that happened. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and maybe just link to this since we're already talking about the issues that she was facing, but um, I know uh, 
we talked about how sexuality and, and expressing sexuality at this time, there was a lot of discrimination and obviously there continues to be and we're in Pride Month right now. Um, and if there's anyone in the room who identifies as like a queer writer who wants to share their own opinions on this, we'd love to hear from you. But I was just curious from your scholarship, like what, what did you find um, about like how that repression was playing out in their lives and played out in their art? Karen, did you want to say anything about that? I mean, uh... well, I, I don't think that Truman Capote really suffered from repression at all. <laughs> His mother would have liked to repress him, but he wasn't happy. <laughs> 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 and um, he just was from the get go. Yeah, I'm me deal with it. And by the way, I'm fabulous. And you'll be sorry if you don't associate with me because I go to the best parties and I say the best things and I have the best friends, so get on board. Um, Tennessee, I think uh, perhaps not quite the same story, Nick? Um, yeah, I, well, I think maybe here's a way that uh, Carson and um, Tennessee were uh, more alike, but, but I think it relates to all of them. And this, you know, I had on our, on our podcast, the McCullough Center's podcast, um, uh, the lesbian writer Sarah Schulman, who is a gay rights activist and a, a novelist who's written a lot about Carson McCullers. And, uh, you know, one of the questions about Carson McCullers is how was she able to write about people who were so unlike herself? That that's that when you read that first novel, especially, I think people are just, wow, how did she do it? You know, and Sarah Schulman's answer is um, she knew what it meant to be outside the mainstream. She knew what it meant to be othered. And so she was able to look at people who were outcasts, uh, that's one of the terms you hear, um, or outside of the mainstream, and knew, could imagine what it was like to be them, uh, because she had experienced something like that. And, you know, it just strikes me that uh, with, with Truman Capote and Tennessee Williams and Carson McCullers, they all had that experience of not being like people in the mainstream. And that allowed them, you know, it, it helped to feed their art. It gave them insight in, um, into some of the characters that they developed, so. Right, I was going to say another thing that they had in common was, uh, you know, we were mentioning Gore Vidal earlier. Uh, now he was sort of to the manner born. He came from money. He knew what fork to use. Tennessee and Truman, not so much. They learned all that and they were outsiders who became insiders by virtue of their own talent and unique abilities. Nobody handed anything to them. They had to scramble for it. And I thought it was very interesting that uh, Truman mentioned that he wanted Marilyn Monroe to play Holly Golightly because she, in her actual life, is much more, yes, I also came from nothing and look at me now, I'm fabulous. You can't, you can't imagine that I was ever living in poverty and you know, being mistreated. So he identified with the underdog because he felt that in his youth, he was the underdog. And while he associated with the rich and famous, the, I think there was always a little bit of class resentment there, which is certainly works its way into answered prayers. Yeah. That's a really, a really interesting moment in the documentary. Um, I'll start to open it up now to the audience if you have any questions, but I'm just curious if you two had a favorite part of the documentary or was there anything that was surprising for you that jumped out at you? Well, the story they told about how Truman was in Tennessee's apartment and the police arrived, he had gotten in through the transom what I loved about that was that when Tennessee told the story, he said, yes, and there's Truman and, and Gore sitting in the apartment and the police are there. And now that's the way Truman also told the story, but Donald Wyndham and Gerald Clark, who is Truman Capote's biographer, both said, oh, no, no, Gore was out with Tennessee and he arrived at the apartment door. So clearly by the time Tennessee told the story, he's like, you know what? It's a better story if Gore is sitting there and he's being arrested too. I'm gonna go with that story. And they're both fabulous. They go with whatever's the best story. And I just thought that was so typical. 
No, it's true. It's true of, of uh, Carson McCullers too. It's like, she was much preferred the good story to the actual fact, you know? And so if you needed to change the facts a little bit to make the story better, then that's what you should do, which she often did. Um, yeah, I love those clips from the, uh, is it, uh, his name is David Frost, I think. Uh, yeah, I love those clips from David Frost. And uh, I, 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 you know, I, you maybe have seen some of the clips from the Dick Cavett show where he used to have writers on. And it's amazing to me that they had television like that in the 70s. Um, and uh, I don't know, I miss it. So it was, I, I, I enjoyed um, those, those segments of the documentary and how they spoke so openly about their, um, their disagreements, their, 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 you know, their, their spats and so forth. Yeah. I know that's something, um, Matthew and Barry, we were talking about, like how they were just talking about like love <laughs> and these big themes on television. So it's interesting you brought that up too, that it's kind of a rare format. Um, mm -hmm. So there, thought, oh, go ahead, Matthew. I thought it was interesting the way they, you know, the intensity of that particular conversation about love. I mean, and a, a number of those conversations, not just that one, but they're, the way they're not mentioning homosexuality, but clearly mention, you know, exploring that and exploring love in relation to it, which is pretty interesting. I, I'm sorry that n no one uh, officially is representing uh, Rockland Pride here tonight. They thought they had a member who uh, would be familiar enough with the story, and, and was, but he was more familiar with modern literature, but ultimately he was unable to attend anyway. But I, I do want to say that it's, you know, at, at that time to be gay men I mean, today we understand how important representation is. I mean, maybe that's a bigger deal in the film industry than elsewhere, but we're, it's a, it's a really hot button topic uh, for, for those in the industry. And it's, it's, it's become necessary for everyone in this industry to deal with it. Um, and I don't know, but, but back then you would be, I don't know if blacklisted is the right word, but basically you'd be told you wouldn't have a career. Look at Rock Hudson, for example, just not allowed to be who he was. Um, yet these two guys weren't really hiding anything. And I'm, I'm really wondering why, I mean, obviously the arts are, are, are obviously, I don't know, that's not even true really, that, but we do probably see more sexual exploration in the arts first maybe not i don't know but um i don't know why these two what is there something about literature that this was allowed that you could that people would buy your books but you couldn't be a movie star but you could be a famous author i don't know is there what's what, yeah any thoughts on that can can, can i speak yeah Ellen. hi yeah, I'm a, a writer, and a, but I'm also a psychotherapist that works a lot with the LBGT community. And um, I have some perspective on this. I mean, I've, I've, I've worked a lot with um, men who were closet, you know, older men who had to be closeted in the 1950s who, who went through hell at that time and, um, you know, couldn't mourn their partners in any kind of public way. But I, th I think that for, I, I was thinking about this whole issue with, with the two of them. And I think on one hand, they couldn't help, they, they just presented maybe a certain way, particularly Truman, you know, he presented very effeminate. He couldn't really pass. So it wasn't like a, an issue for him to be, you know, pretend to be a big macho guy like Rock Hudson, because he could never attempt that. Um, and maybe Tennessee, a, a little bit of that too. but. I think what really influenced them that might be different now is their fathers. They both had very, from the documentary, it seemed they had very problematic, you know, that they felt like their fathers were very disappointed in them, that they never lived up to their father's image of what a man was. And that, that, really, that really weighed them down. When they were talking about their fathers, there, there was a lot of heaviness in both of them. That, that even, 
as liberated as they might be, the fact that they were a disappointment to their fathers or their fathers rejected them, that, that was a very strong component for them. And I also think as, as much as they might have been able to be out, I, I mean, Tennessee mentioned this, that he did not like how his plays were changed in movies, that there was definitely gay themes in his plays that the movies played down. And um, that was of great frustration to, to him, which I can imagine it, it would be. Um, and, and unfortunate. And I, I wonder if the plays could be given, you know, a more open interpretation now, or even movies made with a much more, you know. I think we lost them, but that was a really interesting uh, perspective. And I hope that they can join the meeting again. Um, but well, it, it, I think, you know, it, uh, what she says is true. And, and I think what you were saying, uh, Matthew, is that uh, I th it seems to be true that in literature, um, these things could be explored more, more openly than they could in sort of a, um, a, a more popular culture medium like the movies. Uh, we were talking earlier about Sherwood Anderson's Winesburg, Ohio, in which he deals with things like that. And um, so, yeah, I think that that was probably uh, the issue. And also uh, talking about this idea of representation, another thing that has come up in the McCullough Center podcast, um, I don't know if you all know about this uh, book that came out in the last uh, 18 months or so, My Autobiography of Carson McCullers is written by a woman named Jen Chaplin. Um, who uh, identifies as lesbian, and um, she believes that Carson McCullers was a, a lesbian, and that uh, the book is exploring that. Um, and uh, a, a lot of people disagree about what they think was the true nature of Carson McCullers' sexuality. Uh, Sarah Schulman said she thinks that if she lived now, she would identify as a transsexual male. Um, and you know, Carlos Dew said that she was bisexual, and so. It, I asked her, um, is it important that we get this right? And she said, it's important because of representation mm -hmm. and that Carson McCullers is an important writer and that it is important to a lot of people um, who might have a sexual orientation outside the mainstream that um, we, we, you know, that Carson McCullers represent that. So yeah, I think that is uh, an important aspect of it. Yeah, we um the, I, I I just want to say we're sorry our our, our laptop died but uh, but we're back thank you <laughs> yeah yeah thank you for sharing that perspective um, I, thank you as well for bringing that in I know that I think that was like a tin house book or something um, right mm -hmm. yeah I was really excited by that and I think um, it ties into what we're talking to about the like friendship and the dynamics because um, I wonder too about the idea of like scarcity if there's only a few uh, visible queer writers like does and one gets more attention than the other I don't know I, I, I that kind of comes to mind too that um, just because there wasn't as much opportunity then too hmm. yeah. <laughs> well I think all writers worry about scarcity <laughs> going back <laughs> That whole, you know, professional jealousy, and you know, uh, I mean, that the Truman Capote only ever won one award. That's kind of mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure. Yeah, I was sort of surprised to hear that too. I'm surprised that In Cold Blood didn't uh, win some yeah. award. You know, but yeah. Yeah, and I know you taught a class uh, that focused on In Cold Blood, Karen. Uh, I was, I'm curious if you wanted to share anything about what you explored in that in relation to like art and sacrifice. I know those are some of the things. Well, um, you know, Truman was kind of an autodidact. He um, got into a relationship with a Melville scholar, Newton Arvin, who taught at Smith, I believe. And um, he used to say Newton was my Harvard because he would just pick that man's brain and learn everything he could about Flaubert, about Greek tragedy about, you know, everything that you'd learn in a literature class in a, you know, graduate level course, they would talk about uh, as they were just together. And so he um, would apply these techniques to his own writing. Um, and I forgot what the question is. Look at that. <laughs> just, yeah, basically 
talk about in cold blood. <laughs> So, yeah. um, so, so in cold blood is kind of set up like a Greek tragedy. Here comes fate barreling down the dark highway toward the unsuspecting Clutter family, you know, and it's inevitable and it's going to get there and it's going to get them. And it's all been decided oh. before the first page is written because these guys heard of them way back in their jail cell. They've decided we're going to go and we're going to kill everybody. There will be no witnesses. There's nothing they can do about it. They're, and um, so I think he grapples with this idea of fate a lot. Um, and what I, what, what I like to discuss in my class, we did it, um, it was a film, it was just writing about the arts in general and we viewed the film Capote and we're trying to take on the question of, well, if you're trying to create this masterwork, which Capote was, he thought this was gonna be his magnum opus. This was gonna be, he's invented the nonfiction novel. Um, are you justified in just using everybody in sight? I mean, he was praying that they would hang Dick and Harry because he couldn't finish his novel until they were dead. And he felt terrible about it. You know, this was when his descent into addiction really began was after that happened because he was turning into a horrible person and he knew it. He knew that it was not moral or right to be hoping these guys would die, that he had formed a relationship with and pumped them and won their confidence. And they were writing to him and saying, Truman, you're gonna write to, to the government and try to get us out of the hanging, aren't you? And he's going, um, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> So, you know, how far are you justified in trampling all over people when you're creating art is a really interesting question. Mm. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like In Cold Blood is such an interesting example of that, especially when we're talking about representation, how these writers were, it, it brings up that question of who's allowed to write about who, right? And um, and having representation allows writers who are underrepresented to tell their own story. So that, that's what just comes to mind. Um, it's not really a question, more just a thought about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and it, uh, another interesting question. I don't know, Karen, if you um, discovered this in reading that book, but I'd be interested to know how Truman Capote met Newton Arvin. And the reason I'm interested is that Carson and Newton Arvin were also very close friends and they met at Yaddo. And uh, it, is that right? Yeah. And she used to hang out with Newton Arvin quite a lot. Uh, and, you know, Newton Arvin's story is sort of tragic. He lost his job um, at Smith over his sexuality. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So uh, anyway, a, 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 another another connection there. Yeah, that's actually all in the Gerald Clark biography, including the what became of Newton. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Did you catch that little throwaway line in the film where Truman said, and I read Moby Dick when I was 14 and I was thinking, oh, you did what Newton Carvin told you about Moby Dick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is, he had that other line too where, you know, throwing a shot at, at Tennessee saying like, you don't have to be intelligent to be a writer or something like yeah. that. Um, and that's making me think of this relationship now that he kind of had his own private Harvard, you said. Yeah. Can you believe he said that on national television? Yeah. I mean, that was, that was nasty. You gotta well, admit, that was. Said, he also said that Kerouac, that's not writing, that's typing. <laughs> so. You know, they all came up with all kinds of one-liners. Uh, Wyndham said uh, about answered prayers, and I thought this was really catty. He said, oh, now he's trying to invent the non-written novel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and you mentioned in answered prayers, too. I, I don't know if you touched on it, Karen, that scene you wanted to talk about it with, um, you know, this idea of gossip and who did and did not come to Capote's oh. party. <laughs> So mean to poor Tennessee Williams. Who, how many people have read Answered Prayers? <laughs> oh, well, there's a, there's a chapter in it where there's a famous drunk playwright staying at the plaza who's hired the narrator, who's a small time hustler, to come over and do what hustlers do. But first he wants him to walk his bulldog, which has, you know, defecated all over the suite and 
is humping his leg and, and you know, and, and it's clearly Tennessee Williams. He does everything but call him Tennessee Williams. He describes him so he's completely recognizable. And so everyone's going, my gosh, this is vicious. Why is he doing this to poor Tennessee Williams? Well, I was looking at a list of the people who were invited to the black and white ball, which some of you may have heard of. It was the big party through and through at the Plaza Hotel after he finished in cold blood and he was riding high and he was the toast of New York and there were 500 people and people were fighting for an invitation. Well, a few people who got invited turned the invitation down. And guess what? One of them was Tennessee. And I'm looking at the names in italics on the guest list of the people who turned the invitations down and they all got skewered in answered prayers. <laughs> Every single one of them was on the hit list in that book. So I'm yeah. going, wow, he's paying off grudges. Mm. Well, I, I would just want to, this is something that I was thinking about uh, related to answered prayers and about this business, about uh, uh, professional rivalries and all of that, is that to my knowledge, Truman Capote is the only one among them who actually published a book like that where he sort of openly, uh, you know, skewers, other people and and d does them dirty in print i mean what what do we make of that in terms of who did what and who said what uh you know d does that suggest that i don't know truman capote is the is the bad person here or uh or or is it the case that everyone else did did ill to him and he's just you know giving them their cup up come up it's uh, you know it's it's sort of curious to me I'd be interested to know what any, anybody else has, what your thoughts are on that. I think that poor man was so soul sick by then with, you know, just addiction and going off the rails that he, he, he didn't really have very much perspective. He was surprised that people recognized themselves and cut him dead after that. He couldn't believe that his friends recognized oh my gosh, that's me, and then never talk to him again. He said, hmm. but I'm a writer. What did they think I'm going to do? Of course, I'm going to write about real life and everything I find out. Well, no, these people told him things in confidence and expected it to be treated as confidential. And then he slashed their most intimate secrets in the most form across the pages of magazines because he published excerpts in magazines and everybody was running out to get it. It was a scandal. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It feels like a last grab at power. And, and um, it also kind of shows like what, what it was right, what was art or writing for him? Like this place where he can work out things. And I don't know. I don't know where I land on that. <laughs> um, but it does make me think that all, what he said, all literature is gossip. So it feels like that is was his like thesis statement for his. <laughs> for well, his he thought he was going to be Proust. He said this was going to be his version of remembrance of things past, but you know, it, it really was far too salacious to reach that mm. level. Mm. Well, you know, it's also the case that a lot of times uh, people think they see themselves in the work of writers they know and the writers say, I wasn't thinking of that person at all. I mean, this happened in the case of Carson McCullers and her love triangle and the Ballad of the Sad Cafe. And um, people talked about, well, I don't like how she depicted me in that book. And she was like, I wasn't even thinking of you. You know, you, you, you were, you, you know, that, that's, that's not what I was setting out to do. So I don't know. Yeah, it does feel like a precarious line and you want, you know, you also want freedom as a writer to not be conflated with your narrators or something. And mm -hmm. so I think, yeah, that's interesting to hear she, she defended that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we just have a couple minutes left. So I just want to see, uh, I don't see anything in the chat, but if anyone in the audience didn't get a chance to, yeah, Charlotte. Hi, so I just want to introduce myself. I sent an email to Mr. Norwood, like, in March and I was like, I want virtual events. So yay. Um, but anyways, um, yeah, I'm a high school student. Well, not anymore. Um, but yeah. So my question is, we kind of talked about jealousy and we talked about gay relationships and representation. And I was just kind of wondering, cause 
I like Carson McCullers is kind of why I'm here. I, I love her. She kind of took over my life. And so I'm wondering like, to what extent was she jealous of like the gay men in her life for being able to have like a successful relationship? Hmm. Uh, you mean a, so a, a successful relationship with uh, with someone else, a romantic relationship? Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. Jealousy is not uh, the word that I have ever thought of, but definitely she longed for this really close relationship with someone. And I think this is where uh, people who are Carson McCullers fans and scholars or people interested maybe disagree. My feeling uh, is about Carson McCullers that she was mostly interested in having this really close spiritual relationship with another person, someone who totally got her, understood her, and that she could be herself with. And I really don't think she cared if it was a, a, a man or a woman or who it was. That wasn't the important thing. I also think, and this is where I differ with Jen Chaplin, that it was not so much about sexual relationships. That's not so much what she was interested in. So uh, I, I never thought of it in terms of her being jealous of other people. Maybe she was, and I just never realized that. But um, I do think that she um, sought that sort of relationship. She felt that all humans seek that sort of relationship and that we are almost universally frustrated in seeking that kind of relationship. And that is to me is, is one of the major threads of her work, the heart is a lonely hunter. You know, she says, and we see it in Ballad's Hat Cafe and the Member of the Wedding and you know, all of the great work. So I never thought about it in terms of jealousy though, maybe she was, yeah. Thank I wonder you. if my friends, uh, Kathy Fussell and Scott Wilkerson are listening and have thoughts on that. Uh, by the way, uh, Scott Wilkerson is currently writing an opera uh, based on The Heart is a Lonely Hunter and has also written monologues in the voice of Carson McCullers and knows quite a bit about her. And as I said, Kathy Fussell, former director of the Carson McCullers Center, both people who actually probably know more about Carson McCullers than I do. So if any one of them wanted to chime in, guess not. Oh, well. <laughs> well, feel free to oh, feel. <laughs> Nick, I agree with you completely. And, but I do think that perhaps Carson did find uh, that relationship in her last years with Mary Mercer. Mm. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't entirely frustrated. It was finally she, she was able to achieve that sort of relationship with someone. I, I, I think so. Yeah, and it, it is connecting for me like her Carson's approach versus Capote's approach of what they were both seeking in their art or, or maybe what role art played like in that searching for, you know, whatever was unanswered in them. So I love that tie in. Um, sorry, just like while we're on the topic, um, I just, maybe this is stupid, but I, I've read almost everything except for um, some short stories and The Square Root of Wonderful. And I kind of saw Clock Without Hands as like an outlier. I don't know, just in the way that it's written and just kind of, I don't know, some of the themes and stuff. And I'm just wondering, we talked about the relationship between suffering and art. And I know that she wrote Clock Without Hands um, like during the time that she knew Mary Mercer. And I'm just wondering whether like the, her fulfillment in that relationship finally was like kind of separated her from like the emotionalness, that's not a word, but of her mm. work. Wow, well, that's interesting. You know, I, the, the, she credits Mary Mercer with allowing her to, to actually complete that work. I mean, that's the one that, that took her so long to write. I mean, she wrote those books for which she's famous. Heart is the Only Hunter, I Remember the Wedding, Reflections in the Golden Eye, and Ballad of the Sad Cafe. She had all of them written or underway within about a 10-year period. And then it took her the rest of her career, basically, to write that last novel. And the reason that she met Mary Mercer, who was a child psychiatrist in Nyack, was that, you know, she was having such difficulty and friends recommended that she see a psychiatrist, which she was wary about doing. She thought it might interfere with her creative process. But anyway, that's how she eventually uh, met Mary Mercer. And she credits Mary Mercer with helping her to find the stability, if you will, to actually write it. Um, 
it is, I know what you mean in saying it's an outlier, but I never felt that that was the reason. I mean, maybe you're onto something, Charlotte, but um, I, I sort of felt like um, Carson had these big themes in mind with that book that were a little bit different from the big themes that are so much a part of those other four uh, books that I just named. And, um, and that's mostly why it's an outlier and, and not necessarily because you know, of her relationship with someone else, but, but that could be a, that could be a dissertation. So, <laughs> so what do I know? <laughs> yeah. I always felt that in Plot Without Hands, Carson started to move more into the political, mm. which is not really what she was about, but we also have to think, have to realize that she was very, very ill. Mm. Well, for the whole last 10 years of her life. Yeah. So maybe we should, yeah. um, give her a little cut her a little slack although Flannery yeah. O'Connor didn't you know Flannery said plot without <laughs> hands was the worst book she ever read in her life but mm. that's yeah. another story yeah well thank you all for sharing all of this I felt like I learned so much tonight and I hope everyone in the audience did as well um, I forgot to mention the beginning but we, this was also made possible like by the New York State Council on the Arts um, and we thank them for their funding and we thank all of our partners again for making this possible and um, we hope that those of you in the area can come to see Bill T. Jones uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, and stay in touch with everything we're doing and thank you Nick and thank you Karen and everyone else who showed up with all their expertise. That was great. <laughs> thank you all. I enjoyed it. All right. Thank you. Have a great night. Very okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks, Thanks. Nick. Thanks very, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.